On this Saturday's episode of the Locked On Texan Podcast, B. Scott from Sports Radio 610 joins the show to talk expectations for C.J. Stroud, and we also dive into the YouTube comments. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to this Saturday's episode of the Locked On Texans podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and sometimes on Saturdays. Yes, sir. (laughs) Uh, Thank you to all of our first-time listeners and viewers. If this is your first time stopping by listening or watching, thank you. Be sure to subscribe, like, and comment on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And this is – and for our – excuse me. (laughs) And for our returning listeners – Lending your ear, stopping by to check out the Locked On Texas podcast again. Thank you as uh, as you're taking time out of your day to stop on by while Cody and I continue to talk Texans. I'm your football analyst, John, some sports guy, Hickman. And as always, on the other side of the screen, Texas credential media member, Sports Illustrated's own. Uh, I can keep on running down the, the all the, the names I can attach to him or what he does, <laughs> his, his, his credentials attached to him. With Cody Davis. Uh, today we're looking at all or nothing and realistic expectations with Brandon K. Scott. It's been a while, so that's going to be a fun conversation. But Cody, we're going to kick off today's show looking at some of these YouTube comments. And uh, I got to tell you, man, you guys have been commenting. I, I love it. Uh, mm. I, I love what you guys are are, are saying uh, on the YouTube pages uh, page for us. Um, this is on the Jalen Petrie show. We talked about Houston signing um, former safety Kareem Jackson. Got him off uh, off waivers. We talked about the new role for Damian Pierce, but one of the comments that I like is Ryan Wooley Mammoth. Ryan Wooley Mammoth uh, again. <laughs> I, okay, but uh, pros to Casario making moves all year. I don't think we can skip past what Nick Casario has done. Mm. I think he's done a better job. And, and, and maybe I'm, I'm 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 stretching it because he did a, a good job this offseason. Dalton Schultz was a good pickup. Shaq Mason was a good pickup. Um, we, we thought Jimmy Ward was going to be a p- good pickup, and at the time it was. It just didn't pan out. Mm-hmm. But when you look at what he's been able to do and maneuver through these you know, NFL streets in a waiver wire, looking at Tier Tart, uh Barnett now Kareem Jackson constantly making additions um you you know to this team um you look at how he maneuvered through the offensive line woes right Mm -hmm. I thought that's phenomenal and so I want to kind of shine a little light on Nick Casario right now you know this is this is for this is for you Nick uh he's done a very good job of just maneuvering through the, the woes, the injury woes, the uh, the performance woes this season, getting guys off waivers, adding talent to this team, so much so that I tweeted uh, the other day, and I truly believe this, I don't know how much of a need priority the D-tackle position is going to be for the offseason because depending on how Tart pans out, you're looking at a D-tackle rotation right now that has Malik Collins and Sheldon Rankins, now Tart, now Khalil Davis. Of course, you want to add to that for, you know, get a future guy. But I thought immediately offseason, top priority. Now we're looking at a situation for this team where the secondary overshadows that. The linebacker group overshadows that. The wide receiver group overshadows that. And I, I give a lot of credit to Nick Casario for getting guys like a Barnett when the Eagles let him go. Forgetting Tart from the Tennessee Titans, a division rival, when they let him go. So, Kurt, I'm going to give it to you, but Nick Casario has done a very good job, and I think kudos are in place and congratulations are in place for helping this team stay afloat, for adding talent and depth to this team throughout the season. 
We have went this entire season talking about CJ being named Offensive Rookie of the Year. There was a moment, a short time, like a two-week span, where he was literally an MVP candidate. Um, John, um, you know, all throughout this entire season, this past week, me and B. Scott going to get into it later on, talking about the race, how much should Coach D'Amico Ryans be respected in this race for Coach of the Year. Um, and I think Nick Casario name definitely needs to be in the race for executive of the year. Look, I understand that when you look at a guy, a candidate being named executive of the year, a lot of the times you're looking at executives who has a team no less in has built a team that has made it no less than a conference championship game. And believe me, without a shadow of a doubt, I do not expect the Texans to represent um, the AFC in the AFC championship game. However, John, when you look at how much he has revamped and reshaped this roster ever since the hiring of D'Amico Ryans, Nick Casario name definitely should be in consideration. And you talked about it, you know, mentioning how he was able to maneuver throughout the injuries that this team has faced, especially on that offensive line. And some of the guys that he went out there and signed and and, and and traded for, they ended up being better than what it was in their previous spot, i.e. Kendrick Green. Hmm. Even though we only had Kendrick Green for, what, two games, I want to say? Prior to, him, prior to him coming to the Texans, he was literally being held as arguably, if not the worst offensive lineman in the league. He comes to the city of Houston due to a, a, a trade, a big gamble, by Nick Casario, and for two days, for two games, he literally helped that Texans offensive line stay afloat. Unfortunately, man, I hate knowing that he went down with a season-ending knee injury, but when you take a look at the addition of Kendrick Green and how he was able to help this team is one of the reasons why Nick Casario definitely belongs in executive of the year. And you can go on and on. Every position group, has somebody that Nick Casario has added that has helped this team, i.e. Devin Singletary. I know there were some people, and John, I, I think I was one of those that didn't really think that we was going to get much out of Devin Singletary. However, here we are with two games left in the season. Singletary is one of the main reasons why the Texans have a chance to make the playoffs. And how did he get here? Due to the signing from Nick Casario. So you, you, you know me, John. This is year three for Casario. I always say the first two years, I give him a pass, given everything that was going with. I don't think you could name no general manager in any league, any profession, any sport that had a had, that had a more terrible hand dealt with when he started the job. However, we're not going to revisit the past, but I will say year three, Nick Casario, by the way, him himself was also learning how to how to how to be a general manager himself in this league. But year three has been a phenomenal year for Nick Casario, and I think everything that he has done this year is definitely going to set the team up for an even better twenty twenty four. Absolutely. Now I just want to piggyback off that really quick before we go to some more comments. I think what what what, what Cody, what I'm hearing is, and stop me if I'm wrong, the moves he made this year. Like, look at the offensive line players that they, they got coming back. Green, uh, Fant, uh, 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 you got Patterson, you got the rookie Patterson, you got the rookie uh, uh, Juice, even got Josh Jones, who I don't think needs to come back between him and Charlie Hick. Hmm. But, you know, you look at those moves, those corresponding moves to injuries. You look at the corresponding moves to the D tackle position. Look at some of these moves he's made. Now you're looking at the next offseason and said to yourself, well, if if the next if, if if the next guy mentality happens to come up again because of an injury or whatever, you got mm -hmm. guys that got experience with this team and with this quarterback. You got guys that got experience with this team and this defensive coordinator and this defense and D'Amico Ryan's. And so now I think Houston can finally have, which is something they haven't had in a long time, a true contending depth type of team. And I like that for the Houston Texans. Now, on that same episode, we talked about Jalen Petrie. A lot of you guys did not like the comments that Cody and I had regarding the young player, right? Um, one of them 
One of them was from Swipe87. Texans fans and by proxy Texans media members give up on young players too much. Petrie is in gear two in a different system and is simply a slump. Uh, then the young lady mentioned Jalen Green was crippled by uh, Silas, whatever. Uh, also, <laughs> um, there's another comment that said, uh, where are you? And just added up. He said, number one, KJ never played safety for us. Uh, that's not true. That last season he did line up at safety. Uh, and, I, and number two, Jimmy Ward is on a two-year deal. Well, Houston can get out of that two-year deal if they want to move on and just cut bait, which I think everybody believes that they should. Uh, number three, if you land on IR past week 14, you can no longer be active. I think Cody was just joking about that because – we don't see the foresee the Texans going to the Super Bowl. But what I was getting at with that comment of how I believe that Kareem Jackson would be better suited to help mentor safety uh Jalen Petrie because he has some experience in that wasn't necessarily the safety experience itself itself, even though he does have some experience not only playing a little bit of safety for Houston, but his last few seasons playing safety in the NFL, but mainly centered around how much Kareem Jackson struggled in coverage when he first came into the NFL. That was a big issue for him, so much so that he was moved into nickel at one point to help him out. So I do believe that that is where the mentorship from Kareem Jackson could come in at Mr. Jordan Alexander. But also, profit with Richard. Wild how y'all crap on players, and I'm using the you know clean version, I mess with Petrie no matter what. It's his second year in a different defense. Chill out. Keep the same energy when he comes back and plays to his potential. Don't wait, turn wait, your wait, words wait, wait, wait. around. Hold on. Don't turn your words around and talk high of him. Why don't y'all suit up and go show us how it's done? Uh, really Did quick. y'all listen to the doggone show? Neither one of us was crapping on Petrie. As a matter of fact, if you go and take a listen to everything people have been saying from Jalen Petrie this whole entire season, even when we are still talking about him in a way where he still needs to shine, neither one of us said that we was giving up on the young man. Listen to comprehend, not to respond. And, and I also want to I want to comment and say, what is wrong with saying a player isn't performing well? That's nothing wrong with that. I mean, after a the, game the coming up, back, y'all suit up and show up how it's done. Listen, after he got bitch, yeah, in the game that? prior, well, apparently, and we have respected this young man both through the good and the bad the entire season. We we're not attacking his personal character. We're saying, you know, we're taking. I can see him <laughs> whether it's you know high up top or on or through the TV screen. He's not performing well this year. And, of course, it, you're brought in Adrian Amos. You're seeing Houston Carson get more you know, more burn, right? We're seeing some of these things. And those are corresponding moves because Jalen Petrie hasn't played to the level we saw from him his rookie year. Or let me say this, he's not making the plays. He's not an impact player at the level he was during his rookie year. And that's okay. Y'all, y'all, you want to suit up and go show us how it's done? No, nah, we, we suited up and went to school and, and, and went through the process of becoming, re, you know, journalists and, and, and sports broadcasters. But we're not going to sugarcoat it. Jalen Petrie is a talented player. Same with Damian Pierce, right? New year, new system, new coaches, new everything, and they are not performing. Damian Pierce was not performing. They benched him, took away his snaps, right? And then they found a new role for him, which is what we, we are happy to see for him. We're not going to – we're not turning on these players. We're not turning on these young men. We're simply saying they are not performing well. Houston has to find a way to either A, find somebody that can perform better for them and what they need right now because Houston is one of the worst pass defenses in the NFL – so you bring in Amos, you bring in guys, you give you giving guys more snaps and opportunities, or maybe they can find a way to find a better role for Jalen Petrie. That's all. I'm not suiting up to go play nothing. I'm I'm, I'm 31. <laughs> I ain't played football in 13 years. I ain't getting hit no more. So I I don't understand this with you guys, man. We love these players, right? In in, in a certain sense, right? 
We want to see these players do good. The players do better. The team does better. The team does better. The fans are happier. And also the team does better. They have a better record. They can go to the playoffs. But with a shot at the playoffs on the line, clearly benching Jalen Petrie is something that they needed to do because he was hurting them in the secondary. I don't understand it. But we got B. Scott coming up on the other side. Don't go nowhere. Before we hand it over to B. Scott, that conversation, I'm sure that's going to be a blast. I want to tell you guys about Prize Picks, the daily, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick the more than or less than on two to six player stat projections. Sit back and watch. The winnings roll in. The best part about prospects, they have a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prospects is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an insurance policy. You also can play alongside some of prospects. Favorite players like rapper Meek Mills and comedian Andrew Schultz. You can find the community plays under the promo tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Go to prizepicks.com or download it on your phone. It's a promo code locked on NFL. That is L O C K E D O N NFL for a first time deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prospects.com, use promo code locked on NFL for a first time deposit match up to $100. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to the Saturday installment of Locked On Texans. And joining me, I know it's been a minute, Mr. Brandon K. Scott from Sports Radio 610. Brandon, what's up, man? And welcome back to Locked On Texans. Hey, man, I appreciate you for having me. I'm glad to be back. Hey, I'm just glad to know that I'm still welcome around here. <laughs> I, I know we, we talk enough, we see each other enough and talk enough uh, outside of this show for me to know mm -hmm. that, we, that we still boys and that we still good. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, I'd have to joke around with you. Be like, hey, man, did I say something? Did I do something? Did something happen? <laughs> but, I, I, but I know what level we on, so it's all good, man. Appreciate you for having me back. B. Scott, as you know, as everybody knows, C.J. Stroud has clear concussion protocol, and he will be starting Sunday against the Tennessee Titans. B. Scott, with C.J. coming back, we already know how important this game is. But with C.J. coming back, is there a realistic expectation that you are looking at in terms of his performance? Yeah, I, I think it's interesting to try to have an expectation. Like, what do, do you – hold him to the standard of the C.J. Stroud that you saw before the injury, before the mm -hmm. concussion, or is it kind of a somewhat of a blank slate in terms of letting him get his wits about him? He's missed two games, missed two weeks of practice. I know when he got up there and talked to the media on, on Thursday that the sort of the theme or one of the things that he mentioned was that he didn't feel rusty. Like he felt like he, you know, like he had never left, like he had been out there the whole time. Mm -hmm. And we'll and we'll see if that translates into the game. I have no idea what to expect. It and far be it for me to try to tell you what CJ Stroud is capable of at this point. I do I legitimately do not know. But what I do know is <laughs> they absolutely need to win this game. And having CJ Stroud, having CJ Stroud out there gives you a much greater, I, I'm not breaking new ground here, gives you a much greater opportunity and chance to do that. So, I, I, honestly, I think a diminished C.J. Stroud should still get them the victory. They mm. just beat this team on the road, not even as good of a version of it, on the road with Case Keenum playing quarterback. And he played far from stellar in that game, even though they won it. So, if C.J. Stroud – I'm interested to see what the approach is going to be. Not Like, not mm -hmm. just – you know, his, his, his performance is one thing. Like, how is he going to look? But also, what's going to be the game plan? What yeah. what type of CJ Stroud not only are we going to see, but are they gonna put in front of us? Like are they gonna give us the guy who's just launching deep balls? They're just gonna do go all those go routes and you know, we know how greedy they are as an offense. They love to yeah. take the deep shots. Or are they gonna get the ball out of his hands quickly and try to take advantage of 
quick game and short passes and the running game and try to protect CJ Stroud as best they can? Like, what's the priority? And can you have a mix of priorities in a game like this where you're obviously trying to win the game because you have to, but you also got to protect that quarterback and probably don't want him dropping back however many times with this offensive line that's been, you know, piecemealed the entire season. Hmm. Do you have any concern knowing that this is going to be the first time that we see CJ Stroud come in without Tank Dale? And I only say that because I understand he played the game, of course, against the uh, New York Jets without Tank Dale. And we saw how bad the offense looked in. And now, you know, it's been, what, two weeks since he played, and now he's coming back. But not only is he coming back from a concussion, he's coming back without arguably, if not his favorite wide receiver, his favorite target. And he's also playing behind somewhat of a weakening a weakened offensive line because you also got to take into consideration, you know, George Fant, he has been in and out of the lineup over the last two weeks, I believe. Um, over the last two games, as a matter of fact, George Fant um, didn't even start. It was Charlie Hay. And yep. Charlie Hay looked good against Tennessee, didn't look so good against the Cleveland Browns, which I know a lot of, um, you know, tackles and offensive linemen don't look that good against the Cleveland Browns. But at the same time, it's like this is going to be the first time where there is a lot that's not in C.J. Strauss's favor. Well, I- <laughs> Real quick to go back to George Fant, I want to point out this is a little odd to me. Mm-hmm. You know, like like you mentioned, he has not played, and maybe y'all addressed this at the press conferences. He hadn't played the last game, maybe the last two games, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. He also he also doesn't show up on the injury report. Yeah, and, and so I'm very curious on what the status is, what the situation. Did he get placed? Did he get placed on IR without me? No, know over the last two weeks or last three weeks, he was dealing with a hip injury. Right, and, and there was, the, but he's on the injury report with it. Yeah, though. he was on the injury report. Now I'm hoping that because this was the very first time in like the last three weeks that he wasn't on the injury report. So hopefully he's healthy and he's be able to start. But it was weird. I think it was the game against. I want to say yeah, the, the Tennessee Titans where he was on the injury report. He was listed as available, but Charlie Heck started in his place. And he didn't touch the field at all. Then, of course, last week he was in there and they automatically ruled him out. So that yeah. whole George Fant situation was kind of weird, but hopefully he's available to start for this upcoming game on Sunday. Yeah, and so I even bring it up and ask because it speaks to your question about the you know how worried I am about C.J. Stroud with no tank deal. Mm-hmm. It's not even really just no tank deal. I mean, I think that part of it kind of speaks for itself given what tank means to the offense. But for me, it's honestly a combination of the offensive line, and especially if there's no George Fan. Like if it's Charlie Heck out there instead of George Fan, I'm I'm worried. Even with the mm-hmm. even if even if Tank Dell was out there, to be honest with you, I'd be worried about it. But when you co- combine the fact that there's no Tank Dell and the weapons outside of Tank and Nico, and then I I'll throw Dalton Schultz into this mix as well as somebody who seems to be a consistent weapon for for cj stroud Mm -hmm. but when you look at the diminished weaponry and the offensive line is the same one essentially that got him hurt to begin with and 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 then just the that the combination of those two things and an offensive line that you don't really trust that Mm -hmm. you should that you should that you feel like you should because they've invested so much money in it but it's been injured and it's underperformed in some spots and so it's an offensive line that you don't completely trust. And it's weapons that you're like, maybe they'll get open. Maybe they'll perform. So many of them have had, a few of them have had some pretty, pretty big games this year. But I don't know how great I feel about it going in, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not, I'll say this on the positive side, that you won this game the last time without C.J. Stroud and without Nico Collins, mm-hmm. right? Now you should have both of them. So I feel like there should be something there, but more than anything, like I said before, I am interested in how they play it. How do they approach it? What is the game plan against a team like this uh, in a situation like this, I should say? What is the game plan in a situation like this where your quarterback has not played in a few weeks because of a, con- because of a concussion and you have an offensive line that – Let's be honest, it's prone to give it up. 
We got more of Brandon K. Scott coming up, but first, I'll let you guys know about LinkedIn. So whenever you're hiring for your small business, you want to have as many top-tier candidates as possible to interview. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. We like those two Fs. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast majority, a vast network, excuse me, of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many qualified candidates, so easy that, in fact, 86% of small businesses get qualified candidates within 24 hours. Can't beat that. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Saturday installment of Locked On Texans. B. Scott, look, let me go ahead and say this. I've been around the Texans and the Rockets over the last three years, which means that I've been around through the beginning, the very start of both teams' rebuild. Let me go and process my statement by saying this. At the beginning of both of these seasons, especially with the Texans, did not think playoffs were realistic. I was going to be happy if this team just won six games. However, here we are, two games left. They're on a three-way tie for first place in the AFC South with an eight and seven record. B. Scott, would you be disappointed if the Texans come up short and miss the playoffs, or do you still think it will be a very productive, positive, and good season? And I know that question might sound a little bit crazy, but to me, I'm just looking at it from a standpoint. I just got so hyped and so excited about a potential playoff game. With this team to the point, I'm almost on the verge saying if they don't make the playoffs, it's going to be a disappointment. All right, let me let me think this through as I, I talk. I, I know it's because, I know it's tough. Well, no, because I, I've got an opinion on this, and I want to make sure that I express it and communicate it properly. Because I've mm. thought about this, I thought about this in private, mm. and, and have not just have not had an opportunity to really say it the way I want to say it. Okay, but your, but your question is speaking to the exact opinion. That I've had and wanted to express. So I want to make sure I get this off right. Okay. I feel like we can have our cake and eat it too here in terms of how we view the situation. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, like I don't understand why. I don't understand why we can't simultaneously acknowledge that the Texans are operating with house money mm-hmm. and that they are far better than most people gave them credit for or expected them to be but also at the same time hold them accountable for what they turned out to be Mm. hold them accountable for the team that they've shown themselves to be which is not a bad team they're not a great team Mm -hmm. if we're being honest it's really kind of a mediocre team and it's okay because it is a season of mediocrity yeah like like if you're gonna have a mediocre team this is not a bad year to have one you know and and honestly again going back to playing with house money would take mediocre from where we started you know (laughs) been a while since you know we could call them mediocre they've just been flat out bad so i think you can acknowledge that they're operating with house money they're already far better than you ever really could have expected them to be but at the same time yeah it would be a disappointment if they didn't go to the playoff (laughs) i think i would be i'll put it to you this way too cody i think i'd be more disappointed if they lost this titans game lost the game against the titans mm-hmm. which would effectively knock them out but that would probably make me more disappointed than say if they won the titans game and then lost in indy because mm-hmm. i think that's i think you can excuse that i think i think indy is around about the same caliber of this team so if it if it comes down to hey you, you take care of business against the titans and which you heard me on the radio the other day no excuses to lose against this titans team yeah if, yep. if they lose this game the answer is is yes just the short answer yes mm-hmm. but assuming that they can win this titans game go up to indy and then we see what happens i think if they lose that game you got to kind of just you got to kind of just wear it and take it on the chin now 
does that excuse losing to the Panthers when they did? Mm. Does that excuse their no show against against the Jets? Does that excuse them allowing Desmond Ritter, who eventually lost his job, mm. to to look like a Pro Bowl quarterback against them and then losing that game in Atlanta? Mm. Like I'm I'm looking at three examples of why if they don't close uh, seal the deal and close this out as a playoff team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll be able to look back and say, man, you know what? They should have played better better football against Atlanta. Man, you know what? There's not really an excuse to give up the Panthers' first win of the season, hmm. you know, for you to for you to be that team. Uh, and, and then that coaching staff got fired not long after that. Like you, you lost to a <laughs> like two weeks staff. later. <laughs> you know, like I, I don't I don't feel like there's like we should make excuses for that. And then, of course, the Jets game. I, I, I do think that there are, there are excuses for why they didn't play as well. But, man, it was just so bad, so bad. So n- there will be missed opportunities that you can reflect on if they don't mm-hmm. they don't handle business. But I, I, I honestly and this is not me running away from the question. I think that we are intelligent enough people to work to where we can put something in its proper context and have two thoughts at the same time of yeah they're way better than we thought they were going to be and they're playing with house money and this season is a success from that standpoint Mm -hmm. from the standpoint of really just two things i forget how many games they won you got your franchise quarterback and you feel pretty good about your head coach Hmm. you know like i don't i don't think cj stroud or Demico ryan's has been perfect but they've been pretty damn good and they've been good enough for you to feel good about them being your quarterback and head coach combination of the future. That's a dub to me. That's a dub in and of itself to me. And so you're going to come no matter what happens these last couple of weeks, I feel like you're going to end the season feeling that way. Mm-hmm. So, so count that as a dub, but yeah, at the same time, this opportunity is right here in front of you. You have a mediocre team in a league full of mediocre teams. Mm-hmm. Why, why not you? Why not you be that seven seed? Why not you go out there and take care of business? You know, uh, it, it, to me, to me, the opportunity is just right there in front of them. It's too, it's too prime of, the, of an opportunity not to seize it. I agree with everything that you said, and it leads me into this next conversation that I've been having with a lot of people, and this is why I'm rooting for the Texans to make the playoffs. I feel. Coach D'Amico Rines deserves coach of the year because I just take a look at what he has been able to do in year one, one. And look, don't get me wrong. I understand it. I get it. I, I matter of fact, B Scott, I'm more intrigued by the coach of the year race this season than I am for MVP because the MVP candidates that they're trying to give it to, I just don't understand. First of all, why does it have to be a quarterback? Like there are several players in several different positions that deserves to be in the MVP conversation, but yet they try to give it to a freaking quarterback. However, this, this race for coach of the year from Houston to Indy to Cleveland to Detroit, like I'm just looking at it from a standpoint. I understand it. I get it. And coach D'Amico Ryan's may end up with the short end of the stick, but I just look at every, everything that Coach D'Amico Ryans has helped this franchise with, and two, most importantly, just the fact that they are still playing meaningful football in December. Me and John had this conversation a couple weeks ago, and I said, John, if somebody would have came up to me and said, you know, given the season Detroit had last year, you know, they are arguably the best team in the NFC, or the second or third, however you want to put it. I, I I I can see that. If somebody would have said, look, Indy is going to lose Anthony Richardson in the first part of the season, they insert Gardner Mitchell, they still going to be in the playoff race. I could believe that. But if somebody would have told me the Houston Texans would be sitting here at 87 for the chance to go to the playoff, I'd be like, what the heck are you talking about? That's why I feel Coach D'Amico Rhines deserves and should win Coach of the Year, man. Yeah, and see, I, I'm not going to disagree with you on the point that you make about D'Amico, and I think D'Amico makes a fine case for Coach of the Year. But I do think, like, I would I would slightly disagree about Indy and, and the situation mm-hmm. out there. I, I think that we're looking at very, 
very, very similar situations with D'Amico, what D'Amico Ryans is doing here in Houston and what Shane Steichen is doing with the Indianapolis Colts. But, That's but why it, I, I find it fitting that they would face each other to end the season. Go yeah, ahead. it was fitting that they played. It's funny because 365 days ago, we were sitting here talking about a game neither one of them wanted to win. Yeah, but yeah. I only say that, look, no disrespect to, to – no disrespect at all. But I just look at it from, from a standpoint. Once again, if somebody would have told me that Indy would still be in a playoff race, I would have believed it. But, I mean, the Texans, I had this team with no more but, than but, but, but this is But this is the thing. This is the thing that you're forgetting. And, and this maybe this could be a, a complex of Indy and their dominance of the of the division. Mm-hmm. But, bro, but, bro, they suck. <laughs> the the Colts are not good, bro. They're not like they're not they're mediocre. They're the Texans. Like mm-hmm. I mean, listen, I mean, they they picked fourth, right? They picked mm-hmm. fourth. The Texans picked second and, and ended up picking third too. But I mean, they were in those positions for a reason, man. That is it was true. it was it was a mid off last year, and we're being kind by calling them mid. They sucked. They sucked, and so that's why I say it's very similar. I feel like you can make just as strong of a case for either one of those coaches, D'Amico mm-hmm. Ryan's, and I'm and I'm partial to D'Amico. You know, mm-hmm. I know D'Amico. I ride with D'Amico Ryan. Yes, sir. <laughs> if anybody's a, if anybody's asking, let me just be clear: whose side am I on? Mm-hmm. Okay, who am I pulling for, and who would I vote for if I if they were crazy enough to let me vote for it? The answer is going to be D'Amico Ryan's because I ride with D'Amico Ryan's. Mm-hmm. But but to take a step back and just look at it objectively. I do think that Shane Steichen has a real solid case because I'm I'm very impressed by what they're doing in Indiana. Because I keep, every every week I look up and I'm like, man, Indianapolis sucks. What are they doing? Yeah, How are they winning? I, I don't I like I don't feel like that's a good football team at all at all. <laughs> so so I, I'm I'm very impressed by what they have managed to do. And then I got to throw this out there too, man. Especially since the 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 head to head just t- took place, just happened with the Texans and the Browns. Yeah, I ain't never no. really thought I never really thought much about Kevin Stefanski as a coach. No passionate thought, one way or the mm-hmm. other. Good coach, bad coach. I wouldn't have had a strong take on it if you had asked me 365 days ago. Hell, even 40 days ago, or let's <laughs> say uh, 80 days ago, or whatever. But man, <laughs> you lose Kareem Hunt. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I I did that wrong. You lose Nick Chubb. They got they got Kareem Hunt. Mm-hmm. You lose Nick Chubb. Who's one of the very best football players in all of the NFL? Mm-hmm. Deshaun Watson turns out to not be all that great anymore. No, no. What's is very heartbreaking, by the way. It's wild to think. And then, man, you still putting together a 10 win season, 10 plus win season, potentially. I mean, like, and, and, and here's the case against them is that the Browns don't suck, they do have talent. Yeah. And do have a good reason to be in this position, but they're better than I would have thought. After, like, when things started to go off the rails, when Deshaun wasn't looking that good, and obviously they lost Nick Chubb, I thought, oh, that draft pick that the Texans went and got, that's gonna look pretty good, man. They're not gonna, they're not gonna do nothing. Not and wrong, wrong. <laughs> the 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 draft pick that would have been the Texans that's now going to Arizona. Mm. Is it is going to be a better draft pick than the one that the Texans will get from the Browns? Now I'm cool with it. I'm it's not, true. you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not complaining about it. But it's it is true. that is the facts, hmm. and I and I just feel like what the Browns have been able to do under Kevin Stefanski this year, given what they've uh, what they've lost and how impressive they look. Like nobody's really talked about them as a contender in the AFC, mm-hmm. and I think it might be time. I think it might be time. As weird as it sounds, because they're like, "Well, who's the quarterback? Joe Flacco, the the we ghost." Saw of, Joe, the saw ghost Joe of Flacco did on Sunday. <laughs> Man, I, I, I can no longer deny the Cleveland Browns as much as I'd like to. You know, I'm I'm in my mid thirties, and for all of my life, okay, hmm. I was born in the late eighties, not the mid, the late eighties. So I don't have no recollection of. The Cleveland Browns being a boss, being a yeah, great, being a, being a good team. They have been a joke my whole life. So I've had a hard time wrapping my mind around them not being a joke. And then you look at the situation with Deshaun trading for him and giving him all that money and he not even that good anymore and all of that. And then it's the Browns. You're like, ah, I'm leaving the Browns. 
the, that's a good football team. Hmm. I think D'Amico Ryan's football team and Shane Steichen's football team are still up until this day, two games left in the season, still trying to prove themselves as whether they're really a good football team. We know they're not a bad football team. Yeah. Are they are they good? I think they're still trying to answer that question, the Texans and the Colts. The Browns have asked it and answered it. Hmm. Well, you mentioned Shane, Kevin, D'Amico, got Dan Campbell, you got uh, Mike McDaniels, and I'm going to still throw his name in there, Kyle Shanahan. Like, I, I'm just intrigued, but I've never been in, 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 intrigued by a coach of the year race. And I get it. It's because, you know, I'm covering D'Amico and just seeing what he's doing here in the city of Houston. But, man, it's just an all how, you know, these coaches, the, the six that, that that we just named, man, I, I'm more intrigued by this than the MVP race. I, but I, you know what? I, I think there's something to that. I think there's something consistent with how – and me calling it mediocrity sounds like a slight, but how like just how competitive the league has been, how there mm-hmm. hasn't really been outside of Kyle Shanahan's 49ers. And I know they just lost to the Ravens the other night. Yeah. But that's been the only team that's been like standout great above and beyond great. Um, mm-hmm. And I know John, John Harbaugh, for whatever reason, is not in this in this conversation. That's but another one. <laughs> his, his team on the AFC side now looks like to be the preeminent AFC team. Mm-hmm. But the fact that we've had all of this parity, all of this competitive balance throughout the year, I think it has given more focus to what the coaches are doing because mm-hmm. there's no – the teams and the players themselves aren't standing out beyond just, you know, us loving football and watching them play. Yeah. Uh, but – but so, like, what is each team doing to overcome this, that, and the third? All of the in- injuries. That's been a story of the season, right? You know, mm-hmm. I, mentioned, I mentioned Deshaun. That's that's part of the Kevin Stefanski story. You mentioned Anthony Richardson. That's part of the Shane Steichen story. And we can go on and on, man. Just looking around and and thinking about, you know, just the the war of attrition that's taking place in the NFL, and it makes you, I think, focus on systems, organizations, operations, and coaches are the face of that. Mm. Brandon K. Scott from Sports Radio 610. Brandon, really quick, where can our listeners follow you at on all your social media platforms? I am at Brandon K. Scott on X. I'm going to be a professional today, Cody, and call mm. it X. <laughs> Even though everybody know if you catch me in the street, I'm going to call it Twitter. But for your esteemed mm. program, I'm going to call it X at Brandon K. Scott. And on Instagram, I don't think I don't think Meta has changed the name of Instagram yet. Uh, no, I am, not yet. <laughs> I, am, I am at B. Scott from Hiram Clark. Uh, and of course, obviously, everything is Sports Radio 16. Y'all can check that out. Hmm. And as always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter slash X at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, that's Cody C-O-T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. And be sure to follow my co-host, John Hickman at John underscore Hickman 12. Please be sure to follow, like, and subscribe to the Locked On Texans podcast. B. Scott, happy new year to you, my brother. Um, Can't wait to see what 2024 has in store for us. We definitely got to make sure that we keep this this bond, this, this colleagueship, this friendship, this brotherhood going strong next year. So, of course, you know, we're still going to be doing our thing, man. <laughs> No doubt about it, man. And I'm looking forward to it, truly. Hmm. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.